Well, hello again. Welcome. I'm glad to see you here this evening. It's been a long day, but I believe it's been a blessed day. I've had the opportunity of getting acquainted with some people that I didn't know before, and um, I've also had the opportunity of renewing friendships that we've had for several times that I've been here at uh, the Albany Church. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to study a um, presentation which is titled Mind Manipulators. But before we open the Word of God, we want to ask for Him to bless us as we open His holy book. So I invite you to bow your heads reverently with me as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings that we have received today on your holy Sabbath. The hours of the Sabbath are not over yet, so we still are going to enjoy a few minutes of sacred time. What a joy it is to be able to just to unwind, separate from everything ours, our daily endeavors, and to dedicate 24 hours just to spiritual things to enhance our relationship with you. And we thank you also for your word, your holy word, because your word shows us where we are and where things are trending and how the story of this world will end. We ask that as we study this very important subject that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts, open our hearts, and empower us to live in harmony with every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by talking about physical laws and spiritual laws. A law of our physical being is that we are physically composed of what we eat through our mouth. Spiritually speaking, we are spiritually composed of what enters through our five senses, primarily through our eyes and through our ears. Now this comparison between our physical nature and our spiritual nature is not simply a creation of psychiatry or psychology. It's not my creation. It's a principle that is based on the Word of God. Go with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 3 and 4. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 3 and 4. Here God makes the comparison between what we eat physically through our mouth and what we eat spiritually through our eyes and our ears primarily. This is speaking about the manna episode. You remember the story of the manna? The manna fell six days a week. It never fell on Sabbath. Uh, people were supposed to pick up a double portion on Friday. And uh, so God gave Israel manna in the wilderness. The question is, why did God give Israel manna in the wilderness? Was it merely to satisfy their physical need of food? The answer to that question is no. God gave Israel the manna not only for physical purposes, he gave Israel the manna for spiritual purposes, to teach, to teach deep spiritual truth. And that's what we find in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. It says, So he, that is God, humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. And now comes the reason why God gave them manna. We know that God gave manna to sustain them physically, to make them physically strong, so that there would be no disease among them. But there was a deeper purpose for the manna. The last half of the verse says, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So spiritually, what does the manna represent? Spiritually, the manna represents the word of God. The word of God is spiritual food, just like the manna was literally physical food. That is the principle that we're going to base our study upon. Ellen White has a very important statement that we find in Great Controversy, page 555. That should be an easy page to remember. 555. And uh, she, she talks about the impact of the things that we see and that we hear. 
Here's the statement. It is a law both of the intellectual and spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. What an important statement, short and sweet. Once again, the mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated, in other words, it merges to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Let's talk for a few moments about the human brain. The human brain weighs, on the average, approximately 3.3 pounds. It's not necessarily one of the heavier organs of the body. According to scientists, those who have done research on the brain, the brain has capacity to record the entire Library of Congress 40 times over. Now you're probably wondering how much that is, how much recording capacity the brain has. Let me do the operation for you. The Library of Congress has 16 million volumes, and you multiply that times 40, which uh, is the amount that the brain can assimilate, and the result is 640 million volumes. All can be recorded in the human brain that is composed of flesh and weighs 3.3 pounds. Quite an amazing organ. Not only that, according to those who have studied the brain, in order to build a computer that is comparable to the human brain, it would have to probably be the size of the Empire State Building, and you would need all of the water that goes over Niagara Falls to cool it. But the brain is far more sophisticated than a simple computer. You see, human beings built the computers, and so the human brain is greater than the computer. The computer of the brain is able to make choices. It is able to love. It is able to reason. It is able to do things that a common computer never would be able to do. The brain records everything that comes into it by the five senses. And we are what we allow to come into our brain. In other words, our character, our being, is determined by what we allow to come through our five senses, mainly through our eyes and through our ears. The brain is the capital of the body. In other words, the brain uh, makes all of the functions of the body work. It gives orders based on what we have programmed in the brain. What goes in is what comes out. You've heard the expression, garbage in, garbage out. He who controls the brain controls you. If you don't believe this, just think for a moment of a hypnotist. Do you know that a hypnotist can actually take control of a person's brain and can actually lead that person to commit a murder, even though the person would not do it if the person was conscious, the hypnotist can so control the brain that the hypnotist can lead that person to do what the hypnotist wants. So it's very important for us to be very careful about what we allow to come into our brain and who we allow to control our brain. Every television program, every radio program, every billboard along the road, every book and magazine, every person that we have seen, every suspicion cherished, every word spoken, all is indelibly recorded in our brain. We might not be able to retrieve everything, but you know, if, as you get nearer to the beginning of human history, uh, people had photographic memories. Ellen White, uh, uh, 
tells us, and the, um, the quotation is in the Bible commentary, that the people before the flood did not need books because everything that they saw, they remembered. In other words, they could retrieve from the file everything that they had seen, everything they had heard, and they could do it verbatim, just as they had seen it and they had heard it. In the course of time, the brain has deteriorated. In fact, Ellen White tells us that God created man with 20 times the vitality that he now has. Can you imagine what a brain that is 20 times more powerful is able to do? You know, the theory of evolution tells us that at the further back you go, the more ignorant people were. In other words, those people, you know, they lived in caves and they ran around with hatchets killing dinosaurs. That's the picture that evolution presents. But the Bible does not present uh, man in that way. The Bible teaches us that the farther back we go in history, the more intelligent, the more sophisticated man was because the brain was 20 times more powerful than the brains of those who are in the world today. Our character then is based on what we allow to come through our five senses. If that's the case, if we are what we allow to come in, should we be very careful about what we allow to come into our brain, into our mind? Yes, we should be extremely careful. Let me read you a statement from Ellen White about the brain. This is volume three of the Testimonies, page 69. The brain is the capital of the body, the seat of all the nervous forces and of mental action. The nerves proceeding from the brain control the body. By the brain nerves, mental impressions are conveyed to all the nerves of the body as by telegraph wires and they control the vital action of every part of the system. All the organs of motion are governed by the communications they receive from the brain. That is an amazing statement for somebody who wrote uh, way back before the advances in the study of neurological science. Many thoughts and actions that we assume are spontaneous and uniquely our own, are instead responses to information that has been programmed into our subconscious being without us realizing it. The assault on our senses by the media is extremely dangerous because it is subliminal and unperceived. For example, when we go to the supermarket, we think that we are choosing the product because we like it. But really, what is happening is we are making a choice based on what the advertisers have put in our brain. In other words, what goes into our brain by the advertisers when we go to the supermarket and we're going down the aisle and we go to the cereal section, we say, well, I saw that advertisement about Honey Nut Cheerios. And so that's what we put in our basket. We are being manipulated, in other words. What has gone into our brain through the media influences our actions, influences our choices. Advertisers, to a certain degree, have programmed our brain. Now, there's a very important principle, and it's this. Behavioral responses can be programmed by what goes into your brain. In other words, your behavior can be determined by what you allow to go into your brain. You know, the, the scientist that actually started really studying this and discovered this was a Russian scientist by the name of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov. He'd experimented with dogs. And what he would do is uh, he would use a bell, and when he sounded the bell, he would give food to the dog. And so every time that the, you know, the dog at first, you know, he heard the bell and he would call the dog and he would give the dog food. And then uh, the dog would go off and then, uh, you know, he would ring the bell again and the dog would come to get food. Eventually it came to the point that every time that the dog heard the bell, the dog would come for the food. 
but this scientist, this Russian scientist discovered that uh, the bell could actually make the dog salivate even before giving him the food. Interesting. You know, I know this to be true for two reasons. Number one, because my son has a dog, his name is Dashers, you've been able to meet him, he's a border collie. My wife feeds the dog every day. Uh, he's uh, my wife's pride and joy. You know, we don't have any grandchildren, uh, so we have to be satisfied with grand dogs. And uh, my daughter has uh, two of them, and she's had others, and my son, of course, has this one dog, and we love this dog. And we have a real old cat as well. And that cat is my son, so I guess you could say we have a grand cat too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my wife feeds dashers, and she has a, 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 an aluminum plate and when she wants Dashers to come to get his food, she taps on that aluminum plate. And he usually, you know, border collies can be kind of uh, uh, skittish, you know, they kind of hide, they're not real sociable, they, they have these uh, serious psychological issues, and Dashers isn't the exception. And, and so he goes and hides in the closet. And my, when my wife pounds on the aluminum plate, he comes running, and my wife has to chew him out. Because my wife says, Dashers, quit salivating all over the floor. You see, he's sal he hasn't tasted the food yet, but he's salivating all over the place because the sound of the plate has said, food. What has happened with the dog? He has been manipulated, right? His behavior is based on the sounds that have gone into his brain. There's another example. When I was at, at Andrews University, I had a teacher, the last name was uh, Professor Proctor, and one day he brought his dog to class. We were all kind of surprised because, uh, you know, having a dog in class, we're all sitting there, and you know, there's this great big dog, I don't remember what, what kind of dog it was, but the, he was really big, and he was walking up and down the aisles, and, you know, people were petting him, we're wondering, well, how did this dog get in here? So the class started, and um, the, the teacher said, I'm going to show you Pavlov's experiment by using a different method. And so we were all curious because we were studying a Pavlov at that particular point. So he had a bag of M&Ms. Now, you know that uh, the bag that the M&Ms are, uh, are in is a bag that when you crumple it, it makes noise, right? So what he did, he called the dog by name and uh, he gave the dog an M&M. And uh, uh, the, by the way, the M&Ms did not have, uh, you know, they did not have peanuts because you're not supposed to give peanuts to dogs. And so the dog came, he gave him an M&M, and uh, you know, the dog ate the M&M, and, and he kind of stayed there looking at the teacher, wanting another M&M. The teacher didn't do anything. So the dog went and roamed around the classroom, and uh, then the, the teacher once again rustled the, the paper on the bag, and what do you suppose happened? immediately, like he was shot out of a gun, the dog came up and sat there and he was looking at Professor Proctor wanting to get an M&M. His behavior had been programmed by the teacher. But then you know what he did? He rustled the paper, the dog came and he sat and he looked at the teacher and the teacher just kept on teaching like nothing had happened. The dog went and roamed around and so the teacher once again rustled the M&M bag and the dog came up and the teacher didn't give him anything. After several times, he rustled the bag and the dog didn't show up. And so what had happened? We are programmed by the things that enter our brain on a repetitive scale. What we put into our brain determines our actions. So must we be very careful about what we allow to enter our brain? Absolutely. Now, I see lots of people here that are from my generation. I'm not saying you're old, because if I did say that, I would be saying that about myself, because I said, of my generation. So I'm going to share with you some um, products, and uh, I want you to, uh, to guess what products I'm talking about from advertisements of the time when I was growing up. Larry Pyburn, you are forbidden from answering because he knows them all. He must have been a real television addict back then.
because he, he always immediately answers every single one of them. So I want everybody else to participate. Those of you who were watching television when you were in your uh, late teens, early 20s. Pop, pop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. Alka said, oh, wow, all of you. <laughs> I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Alka says, well, that's right. The choice of a new generation. Pepsi. Things go better with? Coke. Fly, fly the friendly skies? Of United. I'd walk a mile for a camel. <laughs> go blank and leave the driving to us. Greyhound, that's right. Cleans like a white tornado. No, that was Ajax. Ajax. Obviously, you don't use Ajax. <laughs> you have not been manipulated. <laughs> now, uh, so what happens when you go to the supermarket and you see these products? Those are the products that you buy. Because the advertisers have put those things in your brain. And by the way, it's even more effective when there's a jingle with it. Because not only does it appear to your, appeal to your eyes, it also appears, appeals to your ears. And the minute that you hear in your ears the jingle, that you're saying, i got to get that product. You see, victory or defeat in the Christian life depends on what we allow to enter our brain. Our behavior is determined by what we allow to enter our brain. What we allow to come into our brain through our five senses transforms it and determines our behavior. Let's analyze this principle by looking at the implications for our spiritual life. We all want to grow in Christ, don't we? We all want to become like Jesus. Obviously, if we want to become like Jesus, we're, it's not going to happen if we are watching the trash that is available on television and in the movies and uh, in video games and the rock music that's on the radio. That is not going to edify us and make us more like Jesus. If we put those things in our brain, our behavior is going to reflect it. That's the reason why the world is in the condition that it's in. We as Christians want to have a strong spiritual relationship with Jesus. We want our brain to be programmed by our consent by Jesus Christ. So the question is, how does our brain become spiritual? How does our brain become like Jesus? It's by what we put in. And what should we put in? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. This is a very well-known verse. The Apostle Paul here is reminiscing about an experience of Moses in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, Moses went to the top of the mountain, and uh, he said to, to uh, Jesus, who was there, he said, show me your glory. And what did Jesus show him? You know, God didn't show him, Jesus didn't show him a, a brain, brilliant and radiant light. That's not God's glory. You can read in Exodus 33, verse 18, what God showed him was his character. God revealed to him his character, which is God's glory. Amen. And what happened when Moses came down from the mountain? When he came down from the mountain, the glory of God was reflected on his face. You see, the glory of God is contagious. When we spend time with Jesus, the result is that we reflect his glory or we reflect his character. The Apostle Paul is reminiscing upon this experience of Moses in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding, I like that word, not just seeing, beholding, that, that's much more permanent, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and the New King James is a better translation of the verb, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Notice that this is talking about a process. By beholding, we are being transformed 
from glory to glory. In other words, the more we behold his glory, the more we reflect his glory. Now there's an interesting word in this verse. As we behold Jesus, as we behold the character of Jesus, and by the way, we behold the character of Jesus where? In his word. This is what we need to put in our brain, the word of God. Particularly the portions in the gospels that describe the life of Jesus, particularly the closing scenes of his life. But the word that I want us to take a look at here is the word transformed. The word transformed uh, in the Greek language is the word metamorpho. Interesting. It's not a common word in the New Testament. In the New Testament it's used only four times. It's used in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's used in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, and it's used also in Matthew and Mark to describe the transfiguration of Jesus, where it says that Jesus was transfigured, the word is metamorphosis. Let me ask you, what is a metamorphosis? A metamorphosis is a radical transformation, is it not? Let me just share with you my own experience. I've, I've had a direct relationship with what metamorphosis means. I grew up in the country of Venezuela. From the time that I was five till the time that I was 14, I, I lived there. I went uh, to, I got all my primary education there in the city of Caracas, Venezuela, and I had a hobby. My hobby was to hunt butterflies. And you know, if some of you would like, after the meeting this evening, I'll show you a picture of when I was a kid standing with my butterfly collection. In fact, I became quite a collector. I would say I was an amateur entomologist, which is uh, an individual who studies insects. Now, because I was into the hobby of collecting butterflies, I learned an awful lot about them, not only to classify them, but I also learned about their habits. So let me share a little bit of the habits of butterflies. First of all, a butterfly has two births. You say, what? A butterfly has two births? Yes. The mother butterfly lays some eggs on a leaf of a tree, and after a certain period of time, depending on what the species of butterflies is, the little eggs break, and out comes a itsy-bitsy caterpillar. And then that caterpillar begins to eat the leaves from the tree, the very leaves of the tree where the, where the eggs were laid. And this little itsy bitsy uh, caterpillar now grows and becomes a large caterpillar. You know, a caterpillar kind of drags itself along, you know, it can be stepped on very easily. I remember when we lived in Wyoming, uh, I pastored two churches in Wyoming, Torrington, Wyoming, and another one called Lusk. It was about 60 miles from there. So every Sabbath afternoon, I would go to Lusk, which was the smaller church, to preach. And there were certain seasons of the year when the, the road was totally and completely covered with caterpillars, milkweed caterpillars. There was no way you could drive your car without squishing all over them. And, and so, you know, caterpillars, they drag themselves along the ground and anybody can step on them. And they're not particularly beautiful. There are some that are, that, that are pretty, but people are kind of scared of them, especially the hairy ones. In Latin America, there's this theory that if you touch one of those caterpillars, it's going to give you a fever. So nobody gets close to caterpillars. So this caterpillar eats from one source, the source where the eggs were laid, and it grows and it becomes a large caterpillar. When it has reached the point in its growth that uh, it needs to change its nature, it attaches itself to a wall or it attaches itself to a tree and begins weaving a chrysalis. We know it as a cocoon. And so basically, the caterpillar buries itself in a cocoon. And then the cocoon, this is the interesting thing, camouflage is really amazing with the butterflies. 
You know, there's this butterfly that is called the owl butterfly. When it sits on the tree trunk, it never sits right side up, it sits upside down because it has two big eyes on the bottom, on the bottom wings and it looks like an owl. And so the birds who like to eat butterflies don't mess, it, mess with it because they think it's an owl. There's another butterfly, it's gray, and it crackles when it flies through the air and it scares off the birds. And so uh, God has created butterflies in a way in which they have camouflage so that they can protect themselves. And so the, butterf- uh, the caterpillar uh, buries itself in the chrysalis. The chrysalis many times changes colors, the color of the place where the caterpillar is. This is so interesting. And then after a certain period of time, depending on what uh, the species of butterfly is, you can see that caterpillar move violently and it starts to break up and lo and behold when the, it is totally broken open out of the cocoon or out of the chrysalis comes a butterfly. Say now wait a minute wasn't it a caterpillar that went in there? How is it that out of it comes a butterfly? It's hard to understand. It's called metamorphosis. Let me ask you, in which way is a caterpillar and a butterfly similar? They are radically different, aren't they? The butterfly does not drag itself along the ground. The butterfly flies through the air, whereas the caterpillar drags itself along slowly. Let me ask you, does the caterpillar's name change? Yes, it's not long, no longer called a caterpillar. What is it called? A butterfly. Do the habits change? Yes, because now the butterfly sucks nectar out of flowers, doesn't eat the leaves of the tree. Does its appearance change? Oh yeah, you can't tell the difference. It's a radical change. Does what it eats change? Yes. Does the place it lives change? Yes. Everything now is new and different because the caterpillar has gone through a metamorphosis. How did this transformation take place? The change did not come because the caterpillar made its mind, made up its mind that it was going to make the effort to become a butterfly. The change was a result of a miracle of God that scientists are still attempting to understand. The caterpillar became a butterfly by a miracle of God's creation. You see, a butterfly is not a caterpillar with wings. A butterfly is a totally new creation. Isn't that true also in the spiritual realm? By beholding, we go through a metamorphosis, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Previously, we were sinners. Previously, we were lost. We were doomed to death. But then we come to know Jesus Christ. We behold his glory. And we are changed. We are metamorphosed. I'll invent that word. We're metamorphosed into the image of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, expressed it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Notice, if we're in Christ, we're not uh, the old creature with some modifications. No, we are what? We are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We cannot see the power that that did the transformation, but we can see the results of the power of the transformation in the beautiful butterfly. Jesus taught a similar lesson to Nicodemus. Do you remember that Jesus said to Nicodemus that the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit is like the work of the wind? Can you see the wind? No, you can't see the wind. Can you see the effects of the wind? Yes, and there's plenty of it out here since I've been here. You know, I have to be very careful about my hair. You were making fun of my hair? So... I'll just say I had to, you know, put my hand on top of my head so that I would look halfway decent uh, uh, in this production that we're doing. Uh, But, you know, you can't see the wind, but you can see the impact of the wind. 
And so you can't really see the power that transforms the caterpillar into the butterfly, but you can see the end product, which is the beautiful butterfly. You can't see the power that transforms a person into the image of Christ, but you can see the result in a totally changed and transformed person. Ellen White had this very interesting statement regarding Nicodemus. In Desire of Ages, page 172, she wrote, He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. That would be like the caterpillar trying to behave like a butterfly by his own efforts. She continues, There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. In other words, acting like a butterfly when you're really a caterpillar. She continues, listen to this. The Christian life is not a modification or improvement of the old. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm going to do better. That's not the right approach. I'm going to improve. A husband that mistreats his wife says, I'm going to change. But they're thinking that they can do it on their own without the work of the Holy Spirit. She says the Christian life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. We can't change by trying. We can only change by spiritually dying to self, dying to sin as the caterpillar kind of fades away in the cocoon and then comes forth as a beautiful butterfly. But did you notice here that it's not a, the transformation is something, yes, you receive a new nature, you become a new being, but after this you must still continue to behold Christ to continue being transformed into his image. It's a continual process. Yes, the miracle takes place, God gives us a new nature, we're still in sin, we still make mistakes, but through contemplating Jesus, we are changed from glory to glory. We are uh, metamorphosed, if you please, from glory to glory into the same image as Jesus Christ. Now, there's a very important principle then. Once we are in Jesus, we have to abide in Jesus. And that means daily praying, daily contemplating Jesus in the Word, daily witnessing to others about how marvelous Jesus is. It means constantly keeping a connection, a living, vital connection with Jesus Christ. Abiding is vital, because just because you've gone through a transformation doesn't mean that you are going to conserve your life. Let me illustrate with my experience with butterflies. When I went to get butterflies, there was certain equipment that I had with me. I had a jar, and the lid of the jar had uh, holes on the top, and then inside the jar I would put at the bottom cotton, and then I would put some uh, cut up rubber on top of that, and then I would piece, put a piece of cardboard with a little hole in the middle on top of that. And then I would take a very deadly substance called carbon tetrachloride. I don't think you can get that over the counter. It's deadly. That was the, the poison that was going to be used to kill the butterfly once I caught it. And so I would put a little carbon tetrachloride on the cotton, and I would catch a butterfly and put it in the jar. It was a matter of just one or two seconds, and the butterfly was dead. Now let me say, you're probably saying, Pastor Bohr, how could you be an assassin of butterflies? You know, after many years, I started feeling very guilty about this. And so I quit collecting butterflies, and sometimes the pathfinders say, Pastor Bohr, would you come and teach us the butterfly honor? 
And I don't know if you're aware, but with Pathfinders you can either have them catch the butterflies and do a collection, or else now you can have them uh, actually color butterflies in order to fulfill the requirements for the butterfly honor. So whenever I teach the butterfly honor, I always have them color the butterflies in a coloring book by looking at other books because I just cannot stand the idea of killing butterflies. You know, they live such a short period of time, and they're so beautiful when they fly. Why would you want them to be in a box? If God wanted them to be in a box, he would have put them in a box, right? God wants them flying free, like he wants us to be free in the Lord. Flying, so to speak. Well, there was one particular place in Venezuela that I loved to catch butterflies. There were these great big blue butterflies. Their scientific name is Morpho. And there was this national park in Venezuela, uh, actually in the, in the north middle section of the country. Uh, the name of it was Guamitas, and uh, I would go there to catch butterflies. I remember the first time that I went to that national park. Uh, it wasn't a national park at that time. It became a national park later. But I remember the first time that I went there, and I saw this beautiful, large, blue butterfly flying through the air. Now, these butterflies fly in a very interesting way. They don't fly straight. They fly up and down, up and down. And if you're after them, then they really go up and they really go down. And so I go with my butterfly net and I'm running after this butterfly trying to catch it and I'm swinging my net and, uh, and he, the butterfly goes up and I swing the net and the butterfly goes down and I'm you know, stumbling over stones, I'm stumbling over bushes, almost crashing into trees and the butterfly escapes. So I noticed that, uh, that the individual who, who actually take care of the park uh, was kind of smiling and, and almost laughing at watching me do this. So he says, come here. So I went. He says, why are you killing yourself to catch that butterfly? I said, oh, because I'm a butterfly collector. I want to add it to my collection. He says, you don't have to go through all of that, that effort to catch that butterfly. I'll give you a secret. I know that butterfly's weakness. I said, really, what is the butterfly's weakness? He says, those butterflies love bananas. Get a banana, throw it on the ground, leave for a half an hour, and come back. I said, this is too good to be true, it's too easy. So, went to the store with my parents, bought a, a banana, threw it on the ground, left, trying to catch other butterflies. Half hour later we came back, there were five of those blue butterflies sitting on the banana. All I had to do was put the net over them, and I had five of them. You see, does Satan know our weakness? Uh -oh. Satan definitely knows our weakness. He knows how he can catch us. Now here's the good news for the butterflies. Several years later, I went back to the same national park, probably a couple of years later. And I had my net with me, I had my jar with the carbon tetrachloride, and uh, I was going to catch butterflies. And when I went into the gate, into the park, the ranger, because now it was a national park, the ranger says, where are you going with that net? I said, I'm going to catch butterflies. He says, no, you're not. I said, well, I've caught butterflies here before. He says, maybe you have. But this since then has been declared a national refuge for all flora and all fauna, and you cannot catch butterflies. Oh, I was so disappointed. I said, you know, what am I going to do? So I know what I'll do. I went outside the fence of the national park. I took out my banana, <laughs> and I threw the banana on the ground. And any butterfly that had... Had, had gone through a transformation, yes, he'd been a caterpillar, he became a butterfly, had been transformed. Any butterfly that left the refuge became my captive. Now what is the lesson? It's not enough to be born again. We have to abide in Christ. We have to abide in safety through a study of the word, through prayer, and through witnessing about Jesus to others. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You see, we must behold Jesus every day. We must fill our minds with Jesus so that our behavior will be impacted. And as we do that, day after day, we come to reflect the image of Jesus more and more. You know, when I look at Jesus, I see two things. I see something that's beautiful, and I see something that's ugly. And you say, what do you mean, something beautiful and something ugly? Ellen White has told us that we should dedicate an hour a day to behold Jesus Christ particularly the closing scenes. In a few moments, I'm going to read that statement to you. So she says, Behold Jesus at least an hour a day, particularly the closing scenes of his experience here on earth. What are the closing scenes? Gethsemane and the cross. What do I see when I see Jesus in Gethsemane and on the cross? I see two things. Number one, I see Jesus who never sinned, perfect, pure, beautiful. But at the same time, I see something ugly. I see Jesus sweating drops of blood, begging his father to take away the cup of his wrath because he's bearing the sins of the world, crying out three times, if this cup can pass for me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. That's ugly. And so I ask, I say, Lord, you're so beautiful. You're perfect. You never sinned. And look what's happening to you. Why is this happening to you? And Jesus responds by saying, because of your sins. At that moment, folks, I come to love Jesus and hate sin for what sin did to Jesus. Sin is not overcome by fighting against sin. Sin is overcome by beholding the purity of Jesus and feeling my nothingness and then seeing that Jesus gave it up all so that I could be saved. Amen. That's why Ellen White tells us that we should behold Jesus every day, particularly the closing scenes. Listen to this statement from Ellen White. Sons and Daughters of God, page 337. By beholding Christ, by talking of him, by beholding the loveliness of his character, we become changed. Changed from glory to glory. And what is glory, asks the servant of the Lord? Character. And he becomes changed from character to character. Thus we see that there is a work of purification that goes on by beholding Jesus. The statement in Desire of Ages is found on page 83. Ellen White wrote, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. The reason why our characters do not reflect Jesus is because of what we are putting in our brains. We are what we allow to come through our brains. Let me give you an illustration. I had a student when I taught theology in our university in Columbia who was the best student I ever had. Got straight A's all the way through. Why? Because every time that he came to class, he would sit in the very front with his notebook and his Bible and his pen, and from the start of the class till the end of the class, he would only take his eyes off of me as he was writing in his notebook. Straight A's. Several years later, I was preaching in a certain location here in the United States, and uh, this individual, this uh, 
student is actually a teacher now, a theology teacher at Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas. And so I was preaching somewhere and a, a sister came uh, to me and she says, Pastor Bohr, do you know Jorge Rico? I looked at her and said, sure, I know him real well. She says, you preach just like he does. <laughs> Why did she say that? Well, of course, I said to her, I said, well, you know, sister, he was my teacher, for, he was my student for three years. She said, oh, now I understand. <laughs> and, you know, we had him come to our studio maybe a year ago to do a series for us. And it was during the daytime. We didn't have an audience. So I decided that I would sit at the feet of my teacher. You know, he has two doctoral degrees. I only have two master's degrees. So he's gone far beyond his teacher. And so I said, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen to him preach. So I sat there, and it was like I was looking in a mirror. You know, the way he moved his arms, the way he inflected his voice, you know, very similar. By the way, have any of you heard Teeny Finley preach? You know who Teeny Finley is? Mark Finley's wife? In Central California Conference, one time we had a workers' meeting, and Mark Finley and his wife came, and his wife gave several presentations to the pastors. I was amazed. She was a carbon copy or a photocopy of Mark. The way she inflected her voice, the way she emphasized, the way she moved her arms, I mean practically identical to Mark. Why? Well, I think she's lived with Mark a few years. In fact, I know that she's lived with Mark several years. And by the way, she's a powerful speaker. Notice Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Once again, here the Apostle Paul is giving us the secret of victory. In chapter 11, he's mentioned all of the great heroes of faith. And now he is going to draw the lesson from the faith of all of these heroes. He stated, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So notice, lay aside sin. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do you know the, notice the sequence? Lay aside sin, run the race. Now, how do we run the race? Notice, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Beholding Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul. We have time only to look at one more passage, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is an extremely important verse. This is another one of the verses, of the few verses that use the word metamorpho'o, where we get the word metamorphosis from in English. The Apostle Paul, and this is a very well-known couple of verses, many of you can probably recite it from memory. The Apostle Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he says, and do not be conformed to this world. That word conformed is very interesting. What it's saying is, don't take the form of a mold. You see, the mold is the world. And you're poured into the mold, and you take the shape of the world. So the Apostle Paul is saying, don't be conformed, don't take the mold of the world, don't allow the world to mold you in the image of the world. But then he says, but be what? Transformed. Metamorphosis. Have a metamorphosis. Now where does the metamorphosis take place? Be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. In other words, he's saying the secret is the renewing of your mind, taking care of your brain what you allow to come through your eyes and through your ears and through your touch and through your taste, through your different senses, because what you allow to come in is what makes you what you are. 
So the Apostle Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If we are constantly eating junk food, we will have junk health. That's a divine principle. You know, if you have a child that loves to eat cake and cookies and potato chips and stuff like that, and one day you come to the child and you, uh, in one hand you have some delicious chocolate chip cookies and in the other hand you have a carrot and you say to the child, choose which one you want. The child will choose the carrot, right? Yeah, right. What is he going to choose? He's going to choose the junk food. Why? Because he's become accustomed to junk food and the carrot he would consider to be boring. Why is it that we have so many youth who are bored by Bible study? Because they become excited by what they get from the media. You see, the Bible cannot compete with the media when it comes to excitement when it comes to feeding junk food, which people crave. Amen. You have to get used to eating healthy food. In the same way, you have to get used to eating the healthy food of Scripture. You have to learn, teach yourself. I remember when we went to Colombia, we went to the market, and we saw these great big ripe plantains. You know what a plantain is? It looks like a big banana. We said, wow, the bananas are really big in this country. And so we tried to peel them, and they don't peel very easily. And then we ate them and said, ooh, what terrible tasting bananas. Later we found out that they weren't bananas. But you know, in the course of time, we didn't like plantains at first, but in the course of time we came to love plantains. The same happened with papaya. We thought that the worst fruit in the whole world, papaya. Now we love it. Why? because we taught our taste by eating it continuously and we came to love what we didn't love before. In the same way, when we set aside the junk that defiles our minds and when we learn to eat good, healthy, nutritious, spiritual food as it's found in God's holy word, we develop new habits in our lives and we come to love that which gives us good spiritual health. I pray to God that that will be our experience, that we will take that thoughtful hour a day to behold Jesus. And I assure you that if we do that, our life will not be the same. We will be transformed from glory to glory into the same image of our beloved Jesus Christ.